Um, I'm going to discuss briefly our design and theory for, for our project. Um, <coughs> solar water is heated through uh, two methods. One is active solar heating and uh, the other is passive. Um, active is, is what you probably have seen around uh, homes that uh, use to heat their domestic hot water. There's a collector on the roof um, that, and collectors are made out of uh, different materials, but glass, tubing, piping, and water is fed through them, uh, heated by the sun, back down to the hot water tank, the cold water is brought up, and that's basically the concept of our, our uh, design. Um, our design of uh, 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 passive solar is what you would commonly recognize as a greenhouse heating building, uh, window, sun passing through windows, collecting heat, um, those types of situations. Um, and we ended up using both with ours. Um, we had the focused sunlight through the uh, Fresnel lens uh, onto the collector. And we also took our 60 gallon tank and painted it black so that uh, the heat from the sun would be absorbed into the water, kind of double, uh, two different ways, double the way heated. Um, <clears throat> so the basic theory is uh, the sun uh, hits the collectors, sun's energy is focused on the the collectors, the collectors focus that energy um, through conduction uh, of the material that you're using. Uh, the the uh, heat energy is passed through to the water and cycled using pumps. The, the uh, warm water is brought back into the, the main tank, cold off water brought back out. This is our solar collector. Um, we used a three inch steel pipe. Um, we, uh, as Lynn described the Fresnel lens, uh, it is, uh, focuses the sun's rays. And in our case, it was a one meter squared lens that focused down to about two inches. And um, uh, as you'll see when Matt speaks, you'll, the, Temperatures were well in excess of 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, uh, we, we needed to point this lens as well, and uh, Damien's going to talk about the construction of the stand and more depth and uh, how we manually had to uh, adjust uh, for declination and azimuth. This is the, uh, just a diagram of the Fresnel here. Um, it uses prisms um, to, to help that focusing of the, of the sunlight. They're concentric circles, uh, uh, concentric lenses that uh, use the prism to uh, really focus. Uh, materials, uh, as I said, the lens, collector which you saw, we, this is the final design, we used a microfluid pump to slow the water exchange down. Um, uh, a couple different size tubings for inflow and outflow to do that, two five gallon buckets and 60 gallon tank. Um, and uh, this is our, our setup here, the lens, the uh, collector, Water in, water out, and Damien's going to talk about this in more in depth right now. All right. Thank you. So I'm going to come in here and talk a little bit about what happened once we kind of firmed up our design. We, uh, we had a lot of really good ideas, and we realized we had two weeks to do it, and we're dealing with temperatures at 3,000 degrees. So we need to scramble and be safe about all of this. Uh, the, 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 first, the first challenge with that was with our, with our lens, the Fresnel lens. Uh, 
it, it concentrates an incredibly high temperature. It's on a very small spot. If it's out of focus at all, the, the, risk, the risk diminishes considerably. Uh, so we put some wing nuts on the side of the lens so we could knock it out of, knock it out of orientation if we needed it to. Uh, we needed some adjustability in the height and in the tilt in order to keep that focal point on, on target. And we needed to have it integrate with the rest of our system. Our water tank was really heavy, so our struggle was keeping the focal point near a heat exchanger, which was near our water tank. At 50 gallons, we were pushing 500 pounds. Um, it's definitely a, a restriction to what we were capable of doing. Uh, the heat exchanger, this is kind of our final design with a straight steel tube and uh, some the, a fluid pump keeping the, keeping the water moving through it. Uh, so this is framing the Fresnel lens. Uh, we put a stable and adjustable frame on there because we wanted to do a manual tracking system. We had grand plans for a heliostat to, to track the lens, um, but they're, they're, they're pricey and it would have taken some time to dial in, so we, we took it back and we did everything with, with no power. We used a sundial and a protractor with a plumb to orient our degrees and our orientation for the solar influx on the lens, and, and that essentially gave us everything we needed. We put a nail on the top of it to do the uh, manual calibration on the fly if we don't have time to look up what we need. But it worked pretty good. We were able to keep it on focus and the tools we needed to make sure that it was there. Uh, and we got the heat exchanger. It was probably the biggest challenge of our project. Uh, we, we once again scrapped it, scrapped a couple designs in the beginning when we realized how high our, our temperatures were going. We were considering using copper, but we were afraid that the, the capabilities of copper and potentially have a catastrophic meltdown, and we didn't want that. So we switched what we were doing. We put a uh, material under the heat exchanger that consists of, of refractory fire brick because we figured we couldn't burn that. Uh, we, we were kind of wrong. We were able to put a little hole in that fire brick, so it kind of gave us an idea of how hot our temperatures were going. Um, our other goal with this was a zero pressure system because water under pressure dangerous when we're dealing with these kind of temperatures. Once again, we wanted to avoid that. Our water storage. Once again, the, the goal was weight, or the challenge was weight on this. 50 gallons, you know, we, we, we pushed it right up there. Um, you can kind of see a little thermal image here, uh, but our gradient's not too good. I think we'll another one here in a minute. Um, so, <coughs> long and short of it is we had to redesign pretty much everything we made due to the parameters of our experiment. Okay, that's about it. We're going to go to the tools for the data collection and how we came up with some information on that. All right, thank you, Damien. <coughs> so, due to uh, the gracious funding of our sponsors, we had various tools that we were able to utilize, toys to play with, um, for our experiment. Uh, we used data collection through Right here we have it, what's called an infrared or IR temperature gun. With that we were able to measure surface area temperatures, things at like, for example, our, the outside of our water tank, uh, the refractory brick to see how hot we were getting. Anything that reflected light, however, water, um, our steel apparatus that was not painted, um, would reflect the light off, so we had to use other methods. Uh, we also had what's called a thermocouple. Now this is a device used to measure high, high temperatures. It's supposed to be rated at 3,000 degrees. Unfortunately, due to data constrictions, we uh, were only able to measure up to 2,047 degrees. Um, we did get that underneath our ceramic brick and get our focus lens on there, but uh, also, again, due to a little bit of cloud cover, we got it up to about 1,100 degrees. Um, but we know that um, with some later data I'll show you, we were able to get much higher temperatures than that. Another uh, tool that we utilize is a digital thermometer. This was used to measure the water temperature of uh, all of our various experiments, be it a gallon of water in a bucket or our 50 gallon tank. Um, we were able to insert it and measure accurately about the first two to three inches of water wherever we needed to. Um, and last but certainly not least was our Fluke Thermal Imager, which uh, was able to give us some video footage or some images of how the heat was transferring and where our hot spots were actually at. 
Um, our temperature could only exceed 350 degrees, so we weren't able to gauge what we were, but we could see with the color spectrum where our hotspots were located. In our first experiment, um, we took a heating source, which is our st three inch steel pipe, and we had two standard buckets that we filled with three gallons of water. Um, we allowed, we had a high flow uh, water pump that we were pumping water through it at a pretty high velocity, so um, we weren't able to raise the water temperature very much, but we were able to extrapolate how much energy we were sending through the system at that given moment and uh, record the data for that using our various tools. Once we finished that experiment, we were able to take it up a notch into our 60 gallon water tank. And uh, what we did there was we ran our system into the 60 gallon water tank. And every 10 minute intervals, we were taking data analysis of how much water we were moving and how the temperature was raising from that. In our third experiment, we realized that because of our high flow, we uh, one, and we were not getting high efficiency, we slowed it down to our eighth, um, our eighth of a gallon a minute pumper, which uh, lowered the volume and uh, heightened our efficiency quite a bit. We were able to see what you know the difference was from that. So, due to the limits of our testing material or our testing equipment, uh, we had to use materials and their known heat uh, heat capacity to figure out how hot this lens was really getting at focal points. Um, for this, we started off primitively with the melting point of an aluminum can, and as you can see here, within a matter of seconds, we were able to melt a hole directly through it. Um, just off topic, this can was filled with water, and as you can see, where the water level stopped, the aluminum was able to melt and that was part of our experiment due to the water cooling effect. Um, we were able to see that it would not melt with water in it. So we were able to you know, say that we were able to put it through our metal um, device without melting it with water in it. The melting point of glass is 1600 degrees Fahrenheit and in one such experiment, we were able to focus the lens on a wine bottle and uh, create molten glass after a period of time. So from that, we derived that we were getting above 1600 degrees Fahrenheit. So we went a step further and uh, we had a metal sheet of stainless steel for our backing plate, which was one of our design concept flops. Um, oh, and I have a live demonstration. As you can see, stainless steel should not have a big hole in it and we were able to put a hole in it probably in about four seconds with no water to cool it down. So the melting point of steel is at 2200 degrees Fahrenheit, which is a pretty significant temperature. Wear your gloves and eye protection. Mm. Um, we put sand on our refractive, bri refractive bricks um, to see what would happen if we could possibly turn sand into glass. And from this cinder block here, we have effectively turned sand into glass on the top of our brick. So we know from that that on a hot day with no cloud cover, you could be getting in the range of 3,090 degrees Fahrenheit, which is a huge significant temperature uh, on a very small, small area of uh, mass. We were able to uh, get consistent results that uh, for temperature and size that um, the energy concentrated through the solar heat exchange compared to the size gained through our passive heat tam temperature due to area. We were comparable from the area of solar to the area of our water tank. Um, and so those were comparable numbers. We were able to quantify that, okay, this is working. Um, and we were able, what the cool part was, that we were increasing the temperature by two degrees over one minute. And uh, the energy stored in that is approximately 800 kilojoules of energy. This was with the high volume, and in the low volume pump system, we were able to raise that efficiency up by 25%, at least 25 to 30%, which is a significant number, thus concluding that your rate of flow will increase your efficiency due to the heating capacity. Uh, this is all the data that we constructed. We started with our relevant figures, which is the specific heat of water and steel. Um, we took our temperature readouts, and we had our time elapsed, 
and with those form with those figures, we were able to extrapolate our heat transfer formula and how much energy we were getting in and out of our system. So that was quite impressive. Yeah, it was quite a feat to crunch that stuff out, but with the data and the time, we did it. Uh, and I'll hand over the conclusion to Lynn Farmer. Thank you very much. All right, so uh, what we concluded with this uh, uh, nine-day project here on this hot water system was um, we need a good tracking system um, and really some reflective, some good reflective materials. Um, we also concluded that it is not an efficient um, form of technology to heat residential hot water um, because of that low efficiency and high risk of malfunction due to high temperatures. Um, is there any other conclusions that uh, the team would like to, to add? Yeah. It, it, was, it was a pretty interesting exercise to see our, our one meter of concentrated solar comparable to our one meter of, of passive solar on our, on our tanks. And it was, it was, it was kind of satisfying when you, when you run all the numbers and then in the end they, they do actually, it, it makes sense. We were able to get a meter of, a meter of solar energy into a heat exchanger, transfer that energy into our water tank, and really have fairly minimal losses, all things considered. It was a, it was a bit of a challenge, but really pretty satisfying to see that. Yeah, our conclusion for transferring into a residential heating system was that it probably wouldn't be the most effective or efficient, because you're dealing with such high temperatures, it would be a huge safety hazard. And due to the low focus area, um, you would only be, at, you know, we, your efficiency would not be that of something with a broad span um, solar heating unit. However, we did find out that melting glass with a small laser beam of sun was a pretty cool and uh, low electricity usage for some kind of melting or forging apparatus um, because there was no energy involved. It was all manual, nothing required for batteries or anything to create a large source of heat. So that would be some kind of uh, you know, usable application for this. All right. Um, our acknowledgements. We would uh, really like to uh, acknowledge and um, Brad Lay uh, Bradley Layton, Wally Higgins is here. Thank you, uh, Wally. Uh, Jonathan Bow is here. Thank you, uh, Jonathan. Uh, Tim Chester is here somewhere. Thank you very much. Uh, Lee Curran and Home Resources. But also, uh, we really want to uh, make a huge note that this work all was sponsored in part by the National Science Foundation Advanced Technology Education Division. Um, so again, thank you for the 30 minutes that you, you gave us to give this uh, presentation. We really appreciate it. Uh, we'll open it up for questions at this time. Hey, good job, you guys. Hey, sweet, guys. Well, welcome, everybody. Good morning. Thank you for being here. My name is David Glyby. These are my teammates, Michael Rollins and Jason Oshner. Uh, our project for this year that we were assigned for uh, practice from 2016 was to uh, modify and improve a, a project from last year, which was a micro-hydroelectric barge. Uh, supposed to generate electricity from uh, paddle wheels and also from the use of a tr trolling motor. Uh, from uh, a boat, but you know, spin it in reverse and create electricity rather than use it. Um, essentially, it's supposed to capture the energy of the Clark Fork River and uh, produce and store electricity from it. Uh, the reason why this is so so exciting is uh, hydropower has been around for thousands of years, uh, and there's countless design options and applications and uses for it. Um, it's really interesting to see and exciting for us to you know come up with a genuine and unique design and modifications for this barge and, and see how they work compared to other technologies, you know, online or in, in books from years ago. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Michael. He's going to give us a little background on some paddle wheels. Thanks, Dave. All right. So like Dave was saying, uh, paddle wheels have been around for thousands of years. They're incredibly interesting technology that's still in use today, uh, starting fourth century uh, animal powered water wheels to lift water for irrigating crops. Uh, moving on, they uh, started applying gears to these water wheels and eventually started actually using water wheels to power things uh, in the first century AD in China. They were actually harnessing water wheels to power their bellows uh, 
forging cast iron. So it's pretty uh, important advancement there. And, uh, but perhaps the most interesting from the ancient world was fourth century uh, Roman Empire, Barbagall, France. Uh, it wasn't France at the time, but they utilized 16 overshot paddle wheels to drive an enormous flour mill. It's uh, been known as the greatest concentration of mechanical power of the ancient world. Mm. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, different types of water wheels like they used there in Barbagall, the overshot, uh, relatively efficient. We happen to be using the undershot, uh, perhaps the most least efficient water wheel design, 20%. Uh, uh, so a lot of things differently. The pitch back being the most efficient, 90%. Uh, you can kind of see how each of those would provide power to your uh, water wheel. Next, the uh, United States started its electrical production with water wheels, starting with a water wheel driven dynamo just off of a simple mill, and they were using that. Uh, and then they moved to Another spot in Grand Rapids, Michigan, where they actually provided arc lighting, where they're generating electricity, just arcing between two points to provide lighting. Uh, eventually, uh, we got to Niagara Falls, where they actually were able to generate enough electricity to power street lighting for an entire town. And then, in 1893, the first three-phase alternating current hydroelectric power plant uh, just outside of San Bernardino, California, uh, Mill Creek, they had literally had water wheels, paddle wheels, generating with two generators, generating electricity at 250 kilowatts and 240 volts apiece. Pretty considerable uh, power generation from just simple water wheels. How's, a, how's this all work? Well, basically electromagnetic induction. Uh, Michael Faraday discovered that in 1831 and progress from there. And essentially, uh, we're taking an electric motor that you would apply current to, to generate the magnetic field to spin your rotor. Well, if you uh, apply mechanical energy to your rotor and spin that motor in reverse, you get current from that motor, essentially becoming an electric generator. We used uh, a lot of varying materials, pretty simple stuff, uh, wood, steel, some uh, electrical devices, and the methods that we used was pretty simple. We put our barge in the water. Uh, ideally, we uh, had our anchor point directly in line with our barge to get the maximum force to spin the wheels and to spin our turbine. And, and we tried various combinations of one guy in the boat, some rocks in the boat, just trying to get everything balanced to get the maximum amount of water flowing to our water wheels. And uh, we used two digital multimeters at various points, one on the alternator and one on the trolling motor to see what kind of voltage we were generating. Um, turned out we didn't generate a lot, but we'll talk about that later. Um, some of the uh, concept we used to transfer that water wheel down to the alternator was uh, some gear ratios, two 24 inch pulleys, um, and uh, a one and three quarter inch, and a three, uh, yeah, three inch down the alternator. Went from uh, our ideal maximum 16 RPMs at the paddle wheel to almost 1800 RPMs down on the alternator. And that should have been enough to get us uh, electricity. And we'll talk a, a little bit more about how that all worked So we, we initially were, were tasked with a barge that was created from last year's class. So one of our first things we, was we went, we went and did modifications. Last year's class wasn't able to attach the turbine. So that was one of the first things we wanted to do was attach the turbine and we created and constructed a penstock to channel and increase the force to that turbine. We also added bearings to the paddle wheel assembly to decrease the friction and, and increase our efficiency. As you 
can see here, we took a bicycle rim and changed out the previous plywood wheels that they had made last year to uh, give more strength and efficiency as well. After our first test day, we came back and did another brainstorm session and added some more modifications. As you can see our, on our powder, powder wheel here, we added corrugated plastic scoops to create more surface area and increase the force on the paddle wheels. We also spoke the same paddle wheels to decrease the weight on those paddle wheels and uh, also the friction on that system as well. As you can see here, this is our penstock in construction. We have our grades to keep the fish and, and happy things out of our turbine. Um, this is the front, this is the back where the turbine would be. You can see how it's just going to channel that water right in there. On our first dead of testing day, we realized that we had too much pen stock. And we're overcoming our anchor. And we broke one of the tines off our, our anchor. Um, we also found that the bicycle wheels that we changed out on the pulleys did make for a smoother track as well as a sturd sturdier pulley wheel. And the blade scoops also did increase the force to the paddle wheels. All right, some of the results. Uh, we initially calculated that we would we'd want about 14 RPM to engage the centrifugal clutch on our alternator. Unfortunately, we did found that we reached around 16 RPMs on the barge in the water, but as soon as that alternator clutch engaged, it would kick the belt off. Um, and one improvement for that would be to upgrade a belt system to a gear and chain system. It would also make it easier for doing calculations using your, your tooth ratios as well. Um, we did find that our turbine generated a, about a maximum of 1.9 volts after we had modified the penstock. We actually, the second day on the penstock, we cut about half of that out to decrease the force to the turbine. And, and after that, we got about 1.9 volts. And this is the barge together here with our power wheels to our pulley system and our alternator. Um, so in conclusion, we decided either a, a start from scratch, bottom up might be the best option. Um, could even create a, like if you had a pontoon here, pontoon here, one large center wheel versus two on the sides would increase that surface area and uh, better to, uh, instead of having the force on each side, we could alleviate that force on those bearings. Um, another way, if you wanted to stay with the barge, we could also trim the front because when we saw the water, the water would hit since this is more of a flat surface, it would almost eddy around the paddle wheels, which obviously is not, not our optimum choice. So and we even got it to where we could kind of stand either on this side and then bounce the water off us from the paddle wheel, which increased our rotation, or we could stand in front and kind of channel it. So either like trim that would be a good option. We'd also want to change out the alternator with the centrifugal clutch. It was from a Chevy diesel, obviously a diesel motor can handle when that kicks in, it's almost like putting the brakes on on the paddle wheels. Now one option would either do that, either have an alternator that didn't have that, or to create a generator, you know, if we had magnets just around that center pole, as soon as they're spinning, they're creating electricity where we had to reach that around 14 RPM to engage it. And one pen, uh, and then on the pen stock, like we said, we, we cut it down some. We also decided that if you decrease the angle, you would still increase your force to the turbine, but decrease the force on the barge itself. And then we also stagger the blades a little bit. And we also decided that doubling the number of the blades would increase your surface area and uh, efficiencies as well. And I'm going to let Dave come up and give us some video from our test days. Alright. Just queue up some videos here from our test days. 
First one is uh, from day one. Uh, start of this here is uh, going to be a little bit of comic relief. We finally, you know, got the paddles to spin. We're celebrating a little bit, and uh, uh oh, anchor came off. We had to chase it down the river. <laughs> uh, as you can see, once we find it, got a good anchor point that would hold. We're not getting much rotation at all. Not enough force on on this just the, the wooden paddle wheels. It just uh, it was hard in the current trying to get it square and get the same amount of pressure on both paddle wheels to get them to turn together without trying to bind each other up. Second video. This is test A two. This is from uh, our best test where we were, we got we hit that 16 rpm. As you can see, the paddle wheel spinning a lot more smoother, a lot faster. Uh, the added weight definitely did help. Uh, and then with Jason guiding you, Eric, I think he talked about if you stand there, it kind of funnels the water into the paddle wheel a little better than just hit the bar and coming out around. Uh, the problem was is once we hit that and the centripetal plus on the alternator kicked in, it would throw our belt off the pulley system. This is uh, a little bit of a walk around with the barge spinning on its own. With the GoPro camera, as you can see, it's flowing pretty good. You can see a little bit here how it's hitting the barge and kind of going out around the paddle wheel rather than channeling. We think a Vino's shaped barge would filter that in a little better. Fast forward here a little bit to the back. As you can see, the, uh, the corrugated pipe we added to scoops helped out a lot. A little more surface area holds, holds the energy a little bit longer, providing a little more force. Um, as you can see, if we get the paddle wheels running, our turbine wasn't doing anything. So it was hard to combine both technologies and get them to both work at the same time. Just the angles you had to get things at, it just it didn't seem to work well for both. Bit, get a little, little bit of an inside view of the barge. Uh, our two bicycle pulley wheels, uh, the alternator. Back to the Last video is just a little video of when we did get the, the turbine to spin. As you can see, it, the turn that was about what we got our, our 1.9 volts out of it. We think a little bit of a, a blade design difference would probably help increasing the efficiency a little bit, and as we said, the pen stock, re redesigning that as well. So. Next, we just want to uh, make sure we uh, mention some, some important people. Uh, National Science Foundation funded uh, the summer practicum as well as the entire degree program. Good, good. Uh, home resource. Uh, Donated a lot of materials, not, not just us, but to the rest of the groups uh, for free. Free cycles. We got uh, some more of our wheels there. Got those donated as well. Uh, we want to thank Wally, Tim, Lee, John, Bradley, and Jonathan uh, for being an excellent support staff throughout these last two weeks. Lots of uh, input and constructive criticism from them. We also had some guest speakers, Colton Bradley, Jonathan, and Cassandra, helped us out with our presentations and our, and our papers and things, uh, and Bozo Productions for taking our videos for us. We'll open up to questions. All right, thank you guys. Good morning, my name is Greg Gunstead, and I'd like to start by introducing my teammates. To your left is Lance Nichols, and in the middle here is Sean Warner. Together we researched, designed, and built a rocket mass heater for the Sustainable Energy Practicum for summer 2016. So a little background on uh, rocket mass heaters and combustion uh, technologies. Uh, Efficiency for normal combustion systems or contemporary combustion systems are relatively low. Uh, home fire fireplaces are in range from 10 to 40 percent. Traditional coal fire power plants usually are around 30 percent. 
and the newer gasification coal fired power plants can get up at two and above 60% efficiency, and that's just combustion, the amount of energy, latent energy they are actually getting through the system all the way to uh, the demand sources. Rocket mass heaters are based on two primary technologies that have been around for a while, rocket stoves and masonry heaters. Uh, you've all probably seen and heard of masonry heaters. They've been around since prehistoric times. Uh, they, the contemporary designs that you see more today have evolved, especially in Russia, China, and uh, Europe. And basically those are a fireplace insert type deal or a wood stove that you normally see with a lot of brick work that, or uh, thermal mass that uh, flue gases run through and heat up that thermal mass to store the energy like a battery that is released from combustion. And uh, this picture in the top left is kind of a conventional masonry heater. Rocket stoves, there's been a lot of research done, especially recently, to uh, help mitigate resource depletion and health hazards from uh, cooking fires and things like that by NGOs in the developing world, developing countries. And you can see a picture of a small scale one of those in the upper right hand corner. They're fairly easy to construct, fairly cheap, and they can complete a really efficient burn of the wood. Uh, we have found through our research and what was presented to us early on in the class that there's a gap in knowledge as far as how rocket mass stoves and heaters, uh, there's a gap in knowledge in uh, the emissions, especially like the NOxes and SOxes, nitrogen dioxides and monoxides and sulfur dioxides and monoxides that are produced. As these are produced at higher temperatures, it is more likely that you would see increases in these, although they are not always visible from stack emissions like you would expect with like a carbon monoxide, things like that. So uh, for our test, we uh, did some research on three fuel types that were gonna be our main fuel types we used. We found that uh, or we had Montana coal from the Powder River Basin provided to us, and it uh, has a stored latent en energy uh, holding of about 19,000 BTUs per kilogram. And then uh, we were provided with some pellets that are made from recycled plastics or bonded with recycled number four and number six plastics, and wood chips are the primary combustible hydrocarbon in those, and they uh, have a BTU rating of about 22,000 BTU per kilogram. And finally, we used pine pallet wood, which has a BTU rating per kilogram of about 19,000 pounds. And moving on, I'm gonna pass it off to Sean to discuss the theory behind the rocket scope. All right. Um over here you can see the, the flow, or the direction of flow. And uh, the fuel burns down using gravity right here. And you get your horizontal burn right here, the J2. Um, once the hot gas reaches this 90 degree turn, there's um, some turbulence that helps mix oxygen and unburned hydrocarbons. And it grows up in a vortex cools down at the top of this barrel right here, causing or forcing the cool or the cooler air down into the, the ducting and out the exhaust. Um, this also transfers um, heat while it's passing through the ducting into the thermal mass, so increasing the efficiency of the stove. Um, the adiabatic system does not allow heat to transfer to the thermal mass until it reaches the drum. So this is the, and that's the job of the fire brick, the J tube right here and the heat riser. So it won't release any of that heat until it gets up in here. And this is also where the secondary burn happens, <coughs> uh, burning your particulate matter and you know, a clear uh, exhaust, not smoky and black. Um, the 
Venturi effect allows for a low pressure and high velocity, which enhances the horizontal burn. That's what gives you a nice draft, nice constant draft right here. Um, and this graph over here shows the relationship between temperature and CO and NOx. As the temperature increases, your CO is going to decrease, and then your NOx is going to increase. I'm just going to kind of cover lots of the building materials we use to construct our design. Uh, they're reasonably accessible and you can access and uh, you can get them cheap. We got lots of our materials from, uh, I guess they were just kind of stocked out around the college, but generally you can find them at repurposed uh, secondhand building stores and stuff like that. So you can get lots of these things for reasonable cost and construct one of these yourself for fairly cheap if you want to try it. They're pretty fun to play with. Um, starting with fire brick, this is one of the more important components and uh, that's what the J-tube was constructed out of. That's kind of the heart of the rocket stove. I mean, we got this thing cooking up to over 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The fire bricks rated at 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So you need something pretty durable down there. We use lots of masonry, brick, and sand. Oh, I got a calculation here. Approximately 1,900 to 1,950 kilograms of masonry, brick, and sand to uh, make up our thermal mass, our heat storage, basically our battery for our system. And then we used eight inch single wall pipe ducting to uh, circulate the flue gas through our thermal mass and to work as that conduit to kind of spread the heat around our system. A 55 gallon drum was gathered from habitat from humanity and the wood we used was just to build a eight foot long by 36 inch wide by 18 inch tall box to hold all our materials. Uh, our methods to begin our testing, we set a minimum temperature to start each of our burns at, at 1300 degrees Fahrenheit in our burn chamber. And uh, from then we started to add five kilograms of each fuel type. And to judge the rate of feed was just a visual inspection by a person sitting there feeding the tube. And there was kind of a delicate balance between air, allowing airflow into the burn tube, that horizontal burn chamber you kind of see down here, and also uh, keeping fuel to the fire. This thing burns pretty small sticks and it burns fast. Uh, to gather data, we established spots for seven thermal couplers that were rated to 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, we also had a Testo 350 to gather data from our exhaust tube. And down here at the left is a breadboard that <coughs> Mr. Nichols was kind enough to put together for us. And that was how we gathered all our thermal coupler temperature data throughout our system. We had sensors placed in the burn chamber, the base of the heat riser, the top of the barrel, I guess I can back up the slide, the top of the barrel, one at the side of the barrel, and then this is a clean out tube. There was also a thermal couple established in there, and one additional one in the exhaust pipe. Now I'll pass it off to Mr. Nichols. Uh, so, this is uh, some data from a pallet burn we did, and here, these two lines uh, represent the temperature that we have. Um, so this, this orange line would be at the top of the uh, barrel, so this right above the heat riser. And then um, this is at the bottom of the heat riser, so you can really tell the temperature difference, and you can also tell how consistent this line is here. Um, and then 
this, uh, these dots here are the CO and uh, carbon monoxide. And basically when the temperature would drops right here, you can, um, you can see that it drops, you can see that the uh, CO shoots up and that's because the reburn isn't occurring. So it's the, all the particulates and it's uh, not getting a complete burn. Um, so the, so there's a lot more CO coming out of the, the system. Uh, so this is our coal. Uh, here you can see uh, the red line here is CO2 and uh, percent CO2, and the blue line here is O2. And you can kind of see how they're inverses. So that as as more of the oxygen is used up, there's more CO2. And then you can also see that as the temperature increases, the amount of CO2 increases, um, and the oxygen increases, obviously. And then here is uh, just, this is complete temperature. This is only temperature. This is all, all the thermocouples running. And uh, so you can see that uh, it, it, all the temperatures jump up right at the beginning. Um, it's very steep. It's the rocket effect. And it, um, and it maxes out um, here at 2047, which is the maximum rating for the thermocouple. So, uh, and then here at noon, we stop the burn. And uh, you can see how the temperature stayed at uh, very high levels for a long period of time, even after the burn had occurred. Uh, so our conclusion, um, uh, low temps, uh, low temperatures produce um, more uh, particulates and also produce carbon monoxide. And um, NOx uh, 